So this logic that somehow we have to protect the people and not tell them that this is not black and white because otherwise they will be fitna. Look around you, bro. How much more fitna you want before you say we're protecting them from fitna. When Najmi idha hawa ma dhanna sahibukum wa ma rawa. Make the most of this series by downloading our free workbook for a guided contemplation of this powerful surah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الذين يجتنبون كبائر الإثم والفواحش إلا اللمم إن ربك واسع المغفرة هو أعلم بكم إذ أنشأكم من الأرض وإذ أنتم أجنة في بطون أمهاتكم فلا تزكوا أنفسكم هو أعلم بمن اتقى رب الشحف الصدري ويسر لي أمري وأحد العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه اجمعين Once again everybody السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته um, We're going to get right into the study of ayah number 32 I introduced a brief translation of the ayah yesterday just to refresh our memory It's made up of several parts, so keep up with me. It begins with describing the people who have excelled in the last ayah. Those who excelled, Allah will reward them with the very best. Who are those people? The ones who يَجْتَنِبُونَ كَبَائِرَ الْإِثْمِ وَالْفَوَاحِشِ Those who avoid or, or um, keep away from, keep a distance from major sins, the greatest of sins, and all forms of indecency. Inna rabbaka, and then he says, illa lamam, except for small slip-ups. Inna rabbaka wasi'ul maghfirah, no doubt your master is vast in forgiveness. Huwa a'lamu bikum idhan sha'akum min al-ardi, he knows you better when he brought you out from the earth. Wa idh antum ajinnatun fi butuni ummahatikum, and he knows you better from the moment you were hidden inside of the bellies of your mothers. فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Then don't consider yourselves or declare yourselves pure. هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى He knows better the person who has protected themselves. Now, lots of components to this. We're going to take the overall, the overarching philosophy talking about the idea of major sins first. That already starts to indicate that there are categories of sins. There's things that are really, really bad. كَبَائِرَ الْإِثْمِ Kaba'ir comes from kabira, big, so very big kinds of sins. And then by converse, it's already assumed that there are other sins that are not as big, right? Also, you should know that in this religion, there are deeds that have very high level importance. And then there are other deeds that have less and less importance. Even in the study of fiqh, you have things that are haram and things that are makru, for example. Or things that are fard and things that are mustahab or things that are sunnah. And mandatory stuff, optional stuff, right? Absolutely cannot do. It's better if you don't do it. There's, there's a degree, right? Now the problem, the first thing I want you to, to understand is the Quran makes sure that we maintain a sense of priority and a sense of proportion. The way I want you to think about it is there are some things that you absolutely must not do. Or there are some things that you absolutely must do. And then like in, like in school, your, your professor tells you, listen, you cannot cheat on the exam. You cannot plagiarize your term paper. Absolutely not. And he also says, don't be late to class, right? But he's not going to expel you from the university for being late to class. You cannot put those in the same category. You understand that, right? But if you're, and, and don't skip classes. But if you skipped a class or you skipped two classes, you're still not in a, not too bad of a place, you understand? But if you skipped every class the entire semester, but you handed in your term paper, is that still a problem? Yeah. So a small infraction, but done repeatedly can become a big problem. It's, it's a small infraction, but it's being done repeatedly. But the other thing is, if he says, don't come late to class, and you say, okay, fine, I won't come late to class, but you cheat on the exam. And then when he's, when he's expelling you from the university, you're like, you know, I was never late, right? So <laughs> there's something wrong with you because you have a 
twisted sense of proportion. Things that are supposed to be big became small in your head, and things that were supposed to be relatively smaller became big in, big in your head. Now, if you were, if you got caught being late to class, would you be ashamed? Yes. Would that be the end of your life? No. But if you got caught faking doctor's notes or faking, you're, you're putting your name on somebody else's paper and you got caught for that, would the guilt of that be much bigger? It would be, right? And the remorse you have, the regret you have would be much bigger. Would it be much more devastating for you? Would it be a much more difficult thing for you to get over? Yes. But being late to class and you're depressed about it for the next five days, I can't believe three minutes late. I, I don't even know how to. Then you, again, have a psychological disorder. You have a problem. Now, I'm giving you this example because in our religion, there's actually some things you're supposed to feel really, really bad about. Like if you did that, you're supposed to feel really bad about that. Those are the kaba'ir al ithm Those are the major, major sins. Then there are other things. Oh my God, I joined the jama'ah late for fajr. Oh, I missed my sunnah prayers. Oh, I walked into the house, but with my left foot. I forgot to say bismillah before I ate the burger. Or whatever. Something. Small infractions, yes? When you start obsessing over those then you lose sense of proportion. You're misplacing big feelings on small things, right? But I, I want you to understand something. Just like a car or just like a machine, the human heart and our emotions, we have limited fuel. We have limited fuel. You can only be so excited until the juice runs out. Like, you know, for example, being on a treadmill, if you're going at a certain speed, you can only go so long before your energy reserves go low. If you're exhausting so much energy, feeling guilty about small things, then the energy you're supposed to have to feel guilty about big things is being depleted. Do you understand? So what then happens is, let me give you an example of what happens here. It creates what I'm calling here tunnel vision. So you can have someone one of the major things Allah talks about, for example, is make sure you give your wife the mahar. Make sure you give her the mahar, right? He makes it, goes out of his way to talk about this issue. Okay. And he says, if you ask for any of it back when you're getting divorced, are, are you taking a serious allegation on yourself? Are you incriminating yourself by even asking for it back? The, the, the mahar you had given in case of a divorce? Okay. Now you have a person who's never even given the mahar. He's never even given the mahar. But he's losing his mind because if somebody's holding their hands the wrong way in salah, too high or too low, or somebody's scratching their face, or somebody's jeans are too low and they're going below their ankle and they're like, this guy doesn't understand the sunnah. You call that a beard? The face is un-Islamic. And he's... They're really particular about certain things and it's a really big deal to them. And they won't go to a, somebody's house. I'm not sure if they eat the biha or not. I don't know. I, I, they're Muslim, but are they Muslim with a capital M or lowercase? I don't know. So I can't, we can't be sure. Let's find out where they get their goat killed from first. Right? But the same person is completely okay eating the haram money that was supposed to go to his wife. The, no problem. No problem. You know what that is? A twisted sense of what? Proportion. These ayat, then when Allah says, the people who excel, they stay away from major sins. What does that tell you? They're, they're vigilant. They're on guard about the right major things. And even though the smaller things are important, they're valuable, they don't get lost in them to the point and get obsessed with them to the point where the, the major, major things they're supposed to be dealing with are now getting lost. They're, they're not even fulfilling those responsibilities. So the same way, there's so lots of small deeds. The second issue, lots of small good deeds used to mask the seriousness of major bad deeds. This is, again, a twisted sense of proportion. A person says, listen, I know that's haram, but I, you know, Allah is forgiving. And you know Allah is so forgiving? I'm so blessed. I get to do so much sadaqah in Ramadan. And I get, I fast every Monday and every Thursday. And I do this and I do, and you're, 
You've got lots of small good deeds going on and you're secretly helping somebody get a job and you're giving charity and you're volunteering and you're donating blood and you're all this stuff. But all this stuff is really good. It feels good to do good things, but it's masking that like something of the kabair is actually going on. Yeah, I own like four liquor stores, but I, I mean, I use the money for a good cause. I go to Hajj every year with beer money, you know? So I don't drink it. I just drink the Zamzam when I go there. <laughs> so it's, you, know, you still have a drinking problem, <laughs> you know? So, so what happens then is when you have this twisted sense of proportion, you try to compensate for that in your own ways. You tell yourself, hey, listen, I know I'm messed up and I'm doing some kabair al ithm, but because I'm doing these little, little good things, it's not like Allah is not going to count any of it. So you're assuming that's how it works. And you're hoping that because you love to do these good things, but you also love to do these major sins, that you can hold on to all of the stuff that you love and not step out of your comfort zone. These ayat are, the concepts of these ayat are intertwined with each other. Kitabun uhkimat ayatuhu. A book whose ayat are stitched together with each other. Then, you get, if you stay long enough in the twisted sense of proportion, your religion entirely, you call yourself a Muslim, but it's a totally different religion. It's, it's not the same religion anymore. Because the, our religion is defined by what is the priority and what is not, actually. يُنَبَّأُ الْإِنسَانُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ بِمَا قَدَّمَ وَأَخَّرَ Human beings will be informed on judgment day. What did they make a priority and what did they delay? So whatever's not as priority has to get delayed. When small things become your prior priority, that means big things get delayed. And when big things get delayed, you get a the thing that's on your mind the most starts shaping your worldview. It starts shaping your thought process. It starts shaping your opinion of things. When someone, for example, is obsessed with tajweed, Obsessed. Tajweed is great. I love Tajweed. Obsessed with Tajweed. When they're praying, all they're thinking about is what? MashaAllah, that qalqala though. That mud, I was counting one, two, three. It was perfect. Allahu Akbar. To them, the religion itself, even though they're not saying it, the religion itself has become what? Tajweed. And when someone says Quran, they're not thinking the hikmah of the Qur'an, the wisdom of the Qur'an, the guidance of the Qur'an, the reminder of the Qur'an, the thinking through the Qur'an, the instructions of the Qur'an. You know what they're thinking? The ghunna of the Qur'an, the qalqala of the Qur'an. I love Qur'an. When they say I love Qur'an, they mean something else. It's a different religion now. This shift in what the religion means to you, that happens when the sense of proportion is twisted. The essence of Islam is redefined. But then the scariest part, when all sins are deemed equal, when the small and big becomes equal, then I, I, I wrote here the floodgates open. Let me, let me tell you what that means. There are some, and by the way, this is a separate study. If I started talking about this, we would take a course by itself one day. All the major sins Allah talks about in the Quran, all of them are addictions. All of them are addictive. And human, human beings to this day are suffering from each one of them as an addiction. Whether it's zina or alcohol or gambling, go through the gambit. Go through the gambit. They're all addictions, you know? And they're, they're all per, like perpetuated. Like even riba is something that compounds and compounds. Alcoholism compounds and compounds. Addictions, gambling, comp it keeps on getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. It, it, it enhances. Those are the kinds of things that Allah has deemed kabair, fine. Your problem, you cannot protect people from the truth and say if they, if they find the truth, they'll use it the wrong way. Listen, if somebody wants to use something the wrong way, they can even use the Quran the wrong way. And people have. يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا They've used it. The Quraysh even used Surah Al-Najm the wrong way and said, Oh, لَا تْمَنَاتِ الْعُزَّ are legit. So this logic that somehow... We have to protect the people and not tell them that this is not black and white because otherwise they will be fitna. Look around you, bro. How much more fitna you want before you say we're protecting them from fitna? What planet are you living on? 
Hey guys, you just watched a small clip of me explaining the Qur'an in depth as part of the Deeper Look series. Studying the Qur'an in depth can seem like a really intimidating thing that's only meant for scholars. Our job at Bayyana is to make deeper study of the Qur'an accessible and easy for all of you. So take us up on that challenge. Join us for this study, the Deeper Look of the Qur'an, for this surah and many other surahs on BayyanaTV.com under the Deeper Look section.